We've got a lot of scholars in here for the book of Nathan, mm -hmm. I've heard. <laughs> so I'm going to I'm going to test you. There'll be a quiz <laughs> after we get through this. Really We're going to study Nathan for about the next three weeks, I think. There's three chapters to the book, and of course, Nahum's a as I said, it's a little book. It's in the Old Testament, in the Minor Prophets section. Although Nahum would be quick to stand up and tell you there's nothing minor about what I'm saying. Yeah. It's uh, just as important as the big boys, Isaiah, and Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. No, really, the reason they call them Minor Prophets, it's not because their message doesn't carry weight. It's because of the size of the books. That's all. Uh, Nahum uh, is a book. I'm going to give you a little bit of setting for it, not too much, but enough to kind of pique your interest. It takes place 100 years after the book of Jonah. Now, we studied Jonah here, remember? Uh, Jonah was called to go to Nineveh in Iraq and preach, and he didn't want to go, and we know Jonah's story well. Uh, well, it turned out in the end, he, he went and he preached, and the whole city repented that it's, it's probably uh, I think accurately I could say it's the largest revival in the Old or New Testament an entire city <coughs> tore their clothes and repented well this book Nahum that we're going to look at it takes place 100 years after that day and it's sad uh, to see and we're going to see it that Although they repented back there at that revival, they subsequently lost it. They abandoned it, their faith in God, their repentance and everything. And matter of fact, they became a very wicked city in just a hundred years. So much so that God called Nahum to prophesy against that city, its destruction. And uh, that's what we're going to be looking at now. Uh, he, Nineveh is a city. It's in what we would now call Iraq, right on the, the uh, Euphrates River. And it, at that time, this is about 600 B.C., by the way. I forgot to tell you when this takes place. 600 B.C. It's a long time ago. When it took place, it was the capital of Assyria. Assyria. We have the country Syria today. That's not the same. Assyria was over in the country of Iraq. It was subsequently destroyed and conquered by the Babylonians that we've uh, heard of in our Bible studies. Uh, it would, turned out to be a very cruel place. It was not a compassionate city. Uh, for instance, the cross upon which Jesus died. If I ask you where that came from, many of you might say that was a Roman cross. Well, you'd be wrong. That cross was invented by the Assyrians several hundred years before the Romans. The Romans just thought it was a good idea and they picked it up and used it. Uh, they were a cruel people, these Assyrians. Uh, and Nahum is just like Jonah going to preach against them that doom and destruction is coming. That God has had enough and he's going to judge the city. I want to I want to point out just let this hang around in the back of your head as we go through these two or three weeks. I want you to understand and see and uh, appreciate the fact that this is a Gentile nation. It's not the Jews. Uh, sometimes people say, well, what about does God care about the other people in the world? Does He just care about the Jews? And the answer: He cares about all people. Amen. And this book is God dealing with the Gentile country 600 years before Christ. He was uh, punishing them, which implies what? If you're being punished, it implies that you knew what the right thing to do was and you didn't do it. That says that God had spoken to the Assyrian people, that they had had a relationship with him, probably from Jonah's days, and they rejected, and they were being disobedient, so God is angry when we read this book. The second thing I want you to remember, and hang on to this too, because we go through it, it's going to be repeated time after time in the book of Nahum, that God will forgive sin that is repented of, but he will not condone sin that is persisted in. 
this city, this, this Assyrian city of Nineveh, clearly is, is going to show us a city that chose to persist in their sin, and they will receive consequences for that. Okay, now it's interesting, uh, Nineveh, although it's an ancient city and for several thousand years it was in ruins, uh, it has been rebuilt. Uh, it, it came to mind to me, I don't remember if y'all noticed back during the Desert Storm War, we would hear reports on the news about our soldiers in Nineveh. That took place during that war. It's still there. And I had something happen to me here at Travis Avenue Baptist Church one time that was interesting. On Thursdays, every week over here in this building, we have food trucks that arrive from the North Texas Food Bank to, with food that we distribute to the poor on Fridays, right? So I was helping unload the truck one day, and there were these, I believe there were four, might have been five ladies helping. Uh, doing their share of the work, uh, there's 40 or 50 volunteers over there doing that every Thursday, and they're all Hispanic. Uh, they're members of our community, and they're working away, unloading the truck. And I saw these four, you know, and I tried to be friendly with them. Buenos dias, como están ustedes? The next week, same thing. Buenos dias, como están? And went about my business. The third week, one of those little ladies came over and grabbed me by both arms, like this, and said, no Spanish, Iraqi. Oh. Oh. I was so embarrassed. <laughs> uh, and I got to talking to them, and they were from Nineveh. Yeah. All of those four families, they were from Nineveh. The United Nations had brought them over here uh, and resettled them. Uh, very sweet people, Christian people. They were what is called Nestorian Christians. Have you ever heard Nestorian? Yeah. Uh, it is uh, one of the most ancient forms of Christianity on the planet. It has a continuous history uh, to the f first century. And they're alive and well in Nineveh, Nestorian Christianity. So I was blown away. All right. <laughs> Well, that's enough about my silliness. <laughs> let's, let's go to Nahum, the book, and I'm going to be in verse 1, starting out of chapter 1. And it says, this is an oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum of Elkosh. So it starts right off identifying this fact that this is not something that Nahum uh, wrote himself. It's a record of his oracle. An oracle in the Old Testament is prophecy. It's one of those rare times when the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, speaks through the mouth of a human being. It's the source for much of the Old Testament. It is the reason why we can call this the Word of God. It's an oracle concerning Nineveh. That's going to be a subject. That's what he, this Jew now, he's probably in Jerusalem writing about the, the people of Nineveh and that he has received a prophecy from the Spirit of God. And he identifies himself as Nahum of Elkosh. Well, history, we, we don't know where Elkosh was. We, we think it was somewhere in Galilee, northern Israel, but haven't got a clue. You know, maybe those archaeologists, someday they'll dig it up and, and find a road sign or something for us, and we'll know exactly where he's from. Now, when I say it's against Nineveh, I want you to understand, and uh, I, I, I don't want to belabor the point about how cruel and mean they were as a, as a country, but I've got to emphasize that Assyria, of which Nineveh is a city, invaded Israel, about 500 mile journey. They came over there to Israel, they conquered the 10 northern <coughs> tribes of Israel, yeah. right? Israel's, tw how many tribes total? Twelve. 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 They had a civil war, just like us. North and south. The south is two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. The north is ten tribes. Well, Assyria came over here to Israel, and they conquered them, and they did something strange. They put everybody in chains, all the Jews, and they took them back to Assyria with them. 
Now, normally, when a nation conquers another nation, if they don't kill everybody, uh, they'll, they'll just occupy it and rule it. Assyria was not that way. They took everybody, men, women, boys, and girls, back to Assyria as slaves. And so that's what they're hated by the Jewish people for what they had done to their people. Uh, they had displaced them from their land. Now, let's go to verse 2. The Lord is, a, this is Nahum talking now. He's talking to the Ninevites. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord's avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries, and he keeps wrath for his enemies. Uh, you know, it's, it's not easy to stand up here <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and read that uh, when we know that God is love. It's not easy to balance the two, but we must. A lot of folks don't, don't understand that God is both just and a God of love. And what has happened here, Nahum is describing to the Ninevites that your day has come. A line's been drawn in the sand by God. He's put up with this for a hundred years from the time of Jonah, and it's over. There's consequences for your sin. <coughs> now notice, <coughs> notice it says that God's jealous. And that's, by the way, that's pretty common in the Old Testament. It identifies the fact that he's jealous. Uh, somebody says, how can, how can God be jealous? Uh, it's because God will not entertain any rival between him and you. God will not entertain competition for your heart and your allegiance. He is jealous for your heart. He is jealous for you, not of you. There's a difference. This is not a base jealousy, a, a jealousy that's of the flesh. This is the simple fact that because God loves you and created you, has a plan for you that when you deviate from that and abandon him, he's jealous about it. He wants you back. Yeah. And he's saying this, notice, to Denivites here. I want to remind you, Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, <coughs> verse 3. God says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or a likeness of anything that's in heaven above or that's in the earth beneath. For... I, the Lord, am a jealous God. I can visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those that love me. Uh, so there we have it in the law of Moses. God is a jealous God. Uh, don't take offense at that. You ought to be happy about that. You ought to be happy. Because he cares, and he's not going to let you go. He's not going to entertain the, the uh, behavior in you that would let you set up idols in this life other than him. God is God, and he's a jealous God. Now, it goes on in verse 2 to tell us that he takes vengeance on his adversaries. Uh, you know, we're going to find out when we study Nahum here that, that God is interested in governments. God is interested in kings, politics, if you will but he doesn't broker fools. When God is portrayed here as being a vengeful and wrathful, I don't care what country you're from, you need to pay attention. You don't want that for the country that you're living in because it's, an, it's, a, it's a terrible thing. He takes vengeance on his adversaries, those that are against him. Now let's go on verse 3. It says, The Lord is slow to anger, and he's great in power. And the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His ways are in the whirlwind and the storms, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Uh, we're painting a picture here, Nahum, of, of, to you, of who God is, of who he is, and how grand he is. Uh, it's good for us to, to hear the fact that God is slow to anger. I'm glad about that. Amen. I'm glad that he doesn't fly off the handle. I'm glad that he's not impetuous, uh, rash. He's slow to anger and great in power. 
But the next line says the Lord won't ever clear the guilty. He'll never do it. <laughs> We're all uh, born in sin, and we live in sin. We commit sins. Sin is why the Lord Jesus Christ had to die on the cross. Your sin and my sin was all dealt with at the cross on Calvary. Amen. You understand? Amen. All right. So what I'm about to say about this is that that if your sin is not covered at Calvary, that you are still subject to the wrath of God. Right? Right. The <coughs> Ninevites had heard God's love from Jonah. And I, I can't tell you the details of what happened in that hundred years, but they had rejected it. <coughs> they had left it, abandoned all that. So what we've got here is the Lord saying, I'm not going to clear the guilty. I'm not going to bring you in front of me and list your sins and say, well, let's just let bygones be bygones. You go on home. God can't do that. We can do it because we're sinful creatures and we're unjust and illogical in our thinking. But God is God. He's altogether perfect and rational and wise and mighty. He can't think illogically. He can't act counter, counter to his word. And when God said that we have to find forgiveness for our sins in him, he needs it. If you don't, you're left under the wrath of God. And that's where these four unfortunate people are right here. Well, Nahum wants to paint you a picture of how big and how powerful our God is. And the next two or three verses, he's going to use a lot of illustrations. In, in verse 3, he says that his ways are seen in the whirlwind, or you can call that as Texans, you might want to say tornadoes. <laughs> and storms. We've all seen lightning cross the sky from one side to the other, right? Violent storms. And the clouds. He says that that's just merely the dust of his feet. You know, I, I saw a picture last night of what they call a, a rain bomb. Never seen one before. Yeah. It was way off in the distance under this rain cloud. There was a, it went down like this, like this, and it, it was solid rain falling, and it wasn't, there wasn't any over here. It was right there, just a bomb falling. A rain bomb. God is above those clouds, and he's great in his power. Let me let me read a couple of verses and then I'll pause and we'll go back. Verse 4, it says he rebukes the seas and he makes it dry. And he dries up all rivers. I think he's been to Texas. And, you know, I'm, not, I'm not trying to run Texas down. I live here. But you know when I go back east, all their rivers have water in them. And, you know, I, I drive over these rivers sometimes here in Texas, and they'll say so-and-so river, and I get on the bridge, and there's no water there. <laughs> what is that? I don't, I don't understand. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The bloom of Lebanon withers. Now, one more verse. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves before him. The world and all who dwell in it. <coughs> one more. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken into pieces by him. Uh, do you see what Nahum's doing? He's looking at the capital of the Syrian Empire, mighty army, <coughs> uh, powerful country, thinks they've, uh, they're invincible, and he's pointing out to them that they're just grasshoppers in God's plan, on God's world. Yeah. But when we lay alongside the majesty of our God and all of his glory, they are nothing but dust. And he uses illustrations uh, through this that help us to visualize in our mind just how powerful our God is. Uh, back up to three. The Lord will by no means clear the guilty. Uh, sin, I'll say it again, 
sin has to be accounted for, has to be dealt with. Every sin that's ever been committed has to be paid for. It does. In your life, anybody you've ever known, anybody you've ever read about, anybody that will ever be born, every sin has to be paid for, and it will be paid for, either in hell or at the cross. It's going to be one or the other. And I, I can proudly say that God called me for my sin, and he revealed me to me the gospel of Jesus Christ through a dear friend, and I prayed, and my sins were forgiven on that day, and my sin was paid for because of Calvary, yes. right? And had I refused my my good friend's invitation when he shared the gospel with me, and, you know, just gone my own way, well then, the consequences of, of a decision like that is that my sins will be paid for in hell. And that's that's why uh, Nahum is going to such lengths with these people and calling them for their sin. When he says, <coughs> the Lord will by no means, he'll never clear the guilty. All right. I want to point out for you, I read for you, Verses three, four, five, and six. You have them there in front of you. I want to. I want to just read you a little list of some natural phenomena, if you will. Listen to this: whirlwinds, <coughs> storms, clouds, seas, rivers, crops, mountains, hills, rocks, and floods. Those verses all give us those illustrations of how we can see the power of God in our world. Now, I think I've mentioned this before, but I'm going to repeat it to you again. I have a real, I think it's called a pet peeve when I listen to the weather. <clears throat> you listen to the weather. You know, and they always talk about this, this, this high pressure zones moving down from Canada, and the El Nino is pushing up from here, and, and it's going to cause this to happen or that or to happen. But, you know, you never know what's going to happen, but sometimes they're right. <laughs> <laughs> but especially the ones with bow ties. I've noticed if you listen to those things, they're usually right. <laughs> but, I'm, and I'm happy for them that they studied meteor meteor. Uh, but what I am missing in our in our culture and in our media when they're describing weather is any reference whatsoever to my God. Yeah. And I, I say that uh, in all earnestness. When you read both Old and New Testaments, God is in control of this world. When I read that list about mountains and hills and rocks and floods and storms, the Bible attributes their movement and their action to our God. Amen. It does. See, I, I believe when drought comes and people pray for rain, I believe God can send rain. I think I, it was just five or six, six years ago that happened here in Fort Worth that we were in a terrible drought. And the church is all started to pray, and sure enough, we got right. Uh, I guess you could you could describe weather and all of its effects that they talk about on TV. That they're they're talking about the secondary causes. They're describing the phenomena. What I'm saying is the primary phenomena, the primary uh, attributes of weather rest in the hands of our God. Amen. That He's in control of those. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry and dries up rivers. Uh, when Nahum said that, you know what he was probably thinking about? The Red Sea. When God parted the sea for Moses. He did it again when he parted the Jordan River and brought him into the Promised Land. Miracles. Supernatural miracles that he had seen. And in particular, I think it would be honest to say that a bigger miracle <coughs> happened when God parted the waters of the Red Sea 
there was something bigger happened that day. It says they walked across on dry ground. And that's a bigger miracle yet. God dried up the silt and the mud on the bottom of that sea so as people could get across. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting a little hoarse today for some reason. <coughs> Nineveh is hearing bad words from God. Nineveh, however, I believe was a city that God loved. Uh, I go back to the book of Jonah, fourth chapter, verse 11, and John is fussing with God, uh, mad, sitting under a, a, a vine, griping because uh, some worm came and ate the vine and killed it, and he lost his shade. And God shows up and he says, <coughs> Should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that can't discern between the right hand and the left hand, and also cattle. In other words, God cared more about livestock than Jonah did about, uh, about uh, the people. I don't talk all week until I get here and I talk. <laughs> Verse 7, it says the Lord's good. The Lord's good. And he's a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those that take refuge in him. Now I think I think Nahum said that to the Ninevites. And I think he's saying it to people of Judah as well where he lived. <coughs> that the Lord is good. I mean, we, we've talked about all his strength and his, his miracles and nature, but we have to say through it all that he's good. <coughs> and he's a stronghold that we can run to when we're in trouble. I like the verse. It says he knows those that take refuge in him. Uh, he knows your name. He's got you, your name on his mind says in Psalms on the palm of his hand. He knows you. He's going to know you when you arrive in heaven. He's going to be there for us to be a stronghold in the day of trouble and he will allow us to take refuge in him if we come to him. <clears throat> Verse 8, with an overflowing flood he'll make a complete end of the adversaries and he'll pursue his enemies into darkness. A word to Nineveh. God is coming and he's bringing the flood. He's coming and he's going to make an end of you. He's coming and he's going to pursue you till the sun goes down. Three very direct phrases that, that picture the anger that God felt at Nineveh for what they had done to his people and how they had carried them away to their land. Uh, historians tell us something in interesting. Nineveh was, as I said, it's a big city. It had great walls around it. The walls were so so wide and so high that three chariots could ride side by side on top of the wall around the city. It was a massive, massive project to go there. However, that river that ran alongside uh, Nineveh one day flooded. And when it flooded, it under it washed out the foundations of the wall and the wall fell down, and that's how the Babylonian army got in and captured the city. That could be what uh, Nahum's talking about in verse 8. They lost it all. They lost it all when the Babylonians conquered their city to the, so much a degree that they did not exist again as a city until the 1840s. That's 2,400 years, there was nothing there. Verse 9, why do you plot against the Lord? He will make a complete end, and trouble will not rise a second time. Talking to the Ninevites, why do, why do you take it upon yourself? How is it possible that you think in your imaginations that you can take on God? You know, you know I can understand people hiding from God, I can understand people running away from God, <clears throat> but I've never been able to understand someone that thought they could fight against God. It just doesn't compute. 
He's perfect in power and might and majesty. Invulnerable. And yet people plot and, and attempt vain imaginations against him. Read Psalms 2. It says here, Nineveh, you're not coming up another time. They repented in the days of Jonah. They fell away, rebelled against God at Nahum's time. And God's saying in verse 9, when I get through with you this time, there's not going to be a second time. Mm. Harsh words, uh, which, which teaches us, <clears throat> I believe it teaches us for cities, people, and nations, that there is a line that once it's crossed, there's no hope. There's no coming back. And I believe that's what Nahum is voicing here. There's not going to be a second time. It's not that God is not merciful. It's not that God would not forgive. It's that the people themselves have reached a point where their hearts are hardened and they have no ability uh, to, to repent and come back to God. He'll make an utter end of it, it says. He says in verse 10, they're like entangled thorns, like drunkards as they drink. They're consumed like stubble fully dried. Uh, he's just giving death images here. But these people of Nineveh are like a, a field that's been harvested and the stubble's there uh, and there's no life. Like drunkards stumbling around and like a thorn, a briar patch that you get caught up in and you can't move anymore. From you came one who brought an evil against the Lord, a worthless counselor. Um, he's talking about the leader of Assyria here. Sennacherib is his name. He came, he's the one that came to Jerusalem, and all the people were up on the walls looking down at him, and, and he mocked the people of God. He mocked the God of Israel, too. Um, until an angel came. You heard about that angel that came? He was sent by God to the Assyrian army that night, and 185,000 Assyrian soldiers lost their lives in one night by one angel. Thus says the Lord, though they are at full strength and many, they'll be cut down and pass away, even if I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. So here Nahum's talking to the people, the Jews. He's telling them God's going to stand up and afflict the Assyrian people. He's going to judge them and he's going to punish them. But God's not going to afflict the people of Judah anymore. They're safe. I'll break his yoke from off of you and I'll burst your bonds apart. Freedom. Freedom. God's saying to the Jews in verse 13, that this yoke that the Assyrians put on them when they captured them and took them back to Assyria, it's going to break it off. They'll come back home. I want to go to verse 15. Behold on the mountains the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, Keep your feast, O Judah, and fulfill your vows, for never again shall the worthless pass through you. He's utterly cut off. Does that ring a bell? Yeah. Have you heard something like that before? <coughs> Isaiah said words like that. How beautiful on the mountain are the feet of him who brings good news. I used to know a song about that. Y'all remember it? Yeah. Yeah. There's a song about it. Isaiah says it. It's interesting. The Apostle Paul quotes it. The book of Nahum, the book of Isaiah. Uh, generally speaking, when we have beauty contests, we don't look at feet. <laughs> but the scripture says, feet that bring the gospel are beautiful things. Yeah. That's what he's saying. Third, feet are what moves. They're always activity and motion. Feet is what carries preachers to lost people so they can hear the gospel. And that's why it's a beautiful thing. Nahum, Isaiah, and Paul. I want to close with just a, a little tidbit uh, from Dr. Robert Jeffers, First Baptist Church, Dallas. <clears throat> he spoke to our deacon body here about five years ago, and I went and dug it out. 
And I want to do it because of, we're talking here about the Assyrian people being destroyed, their nation destroyed in judgment by God. Right? No argument. You see it? Uh, it happens. And sometimes it happens because of God's wrath and God's judgment on the people. Uh, Dr. Jeffers, when he spoke to us, said uh, he, that he thought the collapse of the United States was inevitable. And here's one. 1962, Supreme Court case, Engel versus Vitale, that removed prayer from school and demonstrated that our government was hostile to Christianity. 1980, High Court decision Stone versus Graham, which outlawed the posting of the Ten Commandments in public schools. 1973, you know that year, don't you? Roe versus Wade, which allowed abortion, and as of this moment, America has just passed 66 million abortions in our country. And lastly, Oberfell versus Hodges four years ago when we legalized same-sex marriage. Dr. Jeffers said no nation can survive that outlaws the mention of God in the public square, that celebrates the killing of its own children, and destroys the most basic unit of society, the family. Yeah. I just read this week the state of Utah has entered this legislation to legalize polygamy. Again. Again. And they're calling it, uh, I don't know if I can say it right, Polly Amori. I don't know, is that the way you say it right? Does anyone know? Because it's broader, the legislation is broader than polygamy. Polygamy generally was one husband, many wives. Uh, this Polly Amori, whatever it is, it means uh, unlimited partners, same sex or different sexes. It could be anything that you desire. So uh, I, I think that, <clears throat> and I don't know, I, I don't have any record in the scripture to re refer to. I don't know what Assyria did that caused the prophet Nahum to be called out. There must have been bad because God made a complete end of uh, Assyria has been gone for hundreds of years, they cease to exist because of the judgment of God. And I think we need to walk in fear and trembling in our nation. We're laughing in the face of God. We don't tremble at his word either. We do, but our culture doesn't, right? Uh, I'm, I'm convinced 100% the only reason God's wrath has not fallen on America is because of the Christian church in America. That's, that's what the restrainer is. Amen. And uh, we need to pray, folks, for our culture and be active and speak up. Uh, you know, they talk about the rapture. We've been talking about that a lot, haven't we? Uh, what will happen when the Christian church is taken out of this world? What will restrain evil and uh, the imagination of men's hearts? Nothing will be holding them back. It's not a place that you want to be, and I don't believe we will be. But anyway, that's chapter 1. We'll look at 2 next week in the book of Nahum. Heavenly Father, we pray this morning to thank you for this minor prophet, Nahum. Uh, we thank you for his being called out to speak to that powerful country, Assyria. And Father, it's because of your written word uh, in ages past that we have in our laps to read that we can understand uh, your ways and your your understanding and your position against our country right now. <coughs> Father, help us to take heart and uh, to apply your ways and your words to our culture. We pray that you let us be light in this world, that we might be salt in this world. We pray, Father, that uh, all of us, uh, all of us singularly and together might be used as an influence in this culture for the gospel of Jesus Christ, for I pray in his name. Amen.